So without further ado, um, we should get started. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce you to Peter Knott, who is a maritime archaeologist um, who runs the education programme for the Nautical Archaeological Society. And tonight, Peter is going to talk to us about maritime archaeology. It's not just shipwrecks. Over to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Claire. And thank you very much, everyone, for joining today. Um, I can't say tonight because it sounds like we've got a few different time zones involved. So thank you very much for everyone who has come tonight. Um, I or today I'm going to now turn off my camera and so you can have full view of all of the pictures. So when I were introduced myself as a maritime archaeologist, I'm usually met by a positive and excited reaction with comments about how amazing shipwrecks are. This is entirely true. Shipwrecks as time capsules are intrinsically fascinating, but there is so much more to maritime archaeology that does not receive the same recognition, which is leading to its accidental and sometimes intentional destruction. While popular culture has a lot to answer for this uneven view, those working in the discipline have the power and responsibility to widen our collective understanding to ensure that our threatened maritime heritage is appreciated and preserved. So this talk today will outline the breadth of maritime archaeology, highlighting the variety of site types from the UK and overseas, particularly those on which I have personal experience. It'll also provide heritage practitioners and history enthusiasts with some practical tips on how to share the excitement of all aspects of maritime archaeology with anyone who cares to listen, and perhaps some who don't. Throughout the talk, I will include some QR codes to link to events and resources that you might find of interest. So have your smartphone to hand or be ready to take a screenshot so you can follow up with these links later on. Throughout my career, I've had the privilege of working on in many locations around the world. I'm originally from Australia and have worked on sites around that large coastline. I've been based in the UK for the last 10 years and have made the most of the shorter travel distances to Europe and America than I was used to from my home country. Tonight, I'm here to break down the stereotype that maritime archaeology is all about shipwrecks. Having said that, I'm often guilty of using shipwrecks as an easy way to connect with people outside the discipline because most people just find shipwrecks interesting. So it's a good place for me to start tonight. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with shipwrecks and then take you on a tour of the many and varied sites that are encountered in maritime archaeology, many of which I've worked on. So let's start off with two very famous shipwrecks. On the left is the Titanic and on the right is the recently found Endurance. I'm really sorry to burst any bubbles, but it is very rare to find shipwrecks that actually look like ships. But when they are found in this condition, they are instant news because their structure is relatable to the, to the general public and their location is romantic and sometimes tragic. So these examples of maritime archaeology that make it to the mainstream news are excellent ways to connect with people and then continue the conversation to give them a more realistic view of the other less famous but just as fascinating aspects of maritime archaeology. Now, here's the other extreme. This is me holding a nail in the crystal clear waters of Croatia. What's so important about a tiny nail, you say? Well, this is the only evidence of the actual ship on a Roman wreck site. There were hundreds and hundreds of sherds of broken pottery in crevices and holes in the rocky underwater shelf. I know because I excavated and recorded loads of them. But the only evidence of there being a vessel there was a single nail, which is why the director was very excited when I found it and he insisted on taking a photo of me with it. It also made the, my photo made the, the annual publication. They were so excited about it. Now, admittedly, it might be a bit hard work to get the layperson as excited as the dig director, but that's why telling the story of an excavation is often just as interesting as the conclusions that are made. Just look at Time Team as an example of that in action. Now, I know I'm still going on about shipwrecks, but I feel that a large part of my job is to transmit the realistic excitement of what maritime archaeology actually is. So you even have the soundscape to go with it now. And this is more likely what you're going to see underwater, particularly in UK waters. This is an archway created by two cannon leaning against each other on the site of the protected Normans Bay wreck, which is actually probably the Weppen van Utrecht, a Dutch ship wrecked off Beachy Head in 1690. I can tell you from personal experience that there is a certain thrill exploring this site, which is a combination of seeing the 43 huge cannons and some anchors on the site, 
understanding the history of the wreck and the risk of bumping your head as you try and navigate swimming through this cannon archway in poor visibility. It is an experience not to be forgotten. And for those who don't dive, or prefer to actually see what they are diving on, we have created this virtual dive trail. This is a short video fly through of a photogrammetry model stitching together thousands and thousands of photos from the Normans Bay wreck. We've turned them into an online model that can be explored from the warmth of your own home. You can see that we have been a little guilty of sugarcoating the experience by making the visibility a lot better than you get in real life. And this is because we also need to make sure that we have access to, for people to access these underwater sites, because only a small proportion of people dive. And even then, when they do actually dive, they can probably only see 5 to 10% of the actual wreck at any one time. So these online models are a really great way to get an overall picture. And often by looking at these models before you dive, you have a better experience afterwards. And we lead people on regular dives on numerous uh, wrecks around the coast and you can come and join us if you're a diver we give you a guided tour so you have a really amazing experience of this historic wreck and if you want to follow up any further you can follow the qr code that is in the corner of the screen now so this is the probably the weapon van utrecht or the norman's bay wreck which we've been working on for 10 years now submarines are a particular type of shipwreck that are often considered different in different ways to shipwrecks. And that's often because they're usually closed capsules. They have the possibility of preserving the inside of the vessel in great detail. But that also means that there are most likely human remains inside, which adds a level of ethics, morals, legal issues, and logistical complexity if one's investigating the inside. We don't investigate on the inside, just to be clear, when we take people diving on submarines. And this is an example of one of the two submarines that we take people diving on. This is the A1 the first British designed submarine to wreck, and it, it wrecked off the south coast in 1911. And just to be clear, it didn't have anyone on board. It's, there's a picture of it um, still afloat uh, on the left, and then a picture of the bathymetric survey of the A1 on the right there. And it's an amazing dive for anyone to experience. And thankfully, submarines tend to be fairly easy to navigate, even for the novice diver. You can kind of understand their cylindrical shape. It's hard to get lost. So underwater archaeologists often end up studying any type of wreck site because it's just where something landed underwater. This may include the remains of tanks, cars and aircraft. Aeroplanes are another example um, that is very prevalent in the maritime archaeology record. They're generally not designed to work on water, but while travelling over the expanse of oceans and seas, it's unsurprising that many of them have ended up underwater or on the foreshore. And we've got an example of each there. On the left, there's an example underwater. And on the right, it's a, a beach wreck. Although the plane may not have inherently nautical connections, it is a common maritime archaeological site that does tend to capture the public's imagination. Now, sometimes if the stars align, you have the right people and funding in place, you don't need to have any kind of virtual model of maritime archaeology site because you can have the real thing available for all to see. I'm hoping that many of you recognise this as the remains of the Mary Rose that were raised in 1982 and subsequently actively conserved over the last three decades and now are housed in the world's largest climate control display case to balance the need for it to be re remain preserved as while also providing access to the thousands of people who want to see it. Most of the population of the UK watched the raising of the Mary Rose in 1982 and it has probably been one of the most effective ways of getting the general public to understand what maritime archaeology is. But the time, effort and cost of this single wreck raising means we don't do it anymore. Of course, there are even better examples of better preserved recovered wrecks elsewhere in the world. Can you believe that this is actually a wreck? Well, it is. This is the raised remains of the Vasa, which sank on its maiden voyage in 1628 in Stockholm. 331 years later, it was raised and towed the thousand metres back to the dock where it had been constructed. It didn't have a very long journey. It is now the most successful museum in the world with at least one million visitors every year. I've had the privilege to take two NAS members trips on a curator's tour of this vessel, which involved going on board 
I'm, I'm really annoyed that I haven't taken a selfie on board, but I was actually there to take the picture on the left. That was me taking the picture. I was on board. I can't believe it. It was an amazing experience. Um, and in the in, you can see in the middle, there's a picture of the latest group of NAS members that went just in the last uh, last December. And there's just a stunning view of the stern of the ship with all of its beautiful carvings. Can you believe this ship was underwater for over 300 years? This is certainly a tangible way for the general public to learn about our maritime past. Now, sometimes you can go one step further with shipwrecks and create reconstructions, which makes them instantly more relatable to the general public. Here you can see an image of the Kyrenia shipwreck in situ off the north coast of Cyprus. This 300 BC shipwreck was raised in the 1960s, conserved, and is on display in the local castle. I can vouch for it being an amazing place to visit, a shipwreck and a castle, but I have a vested interest and background knowledge to help me interpret the displayed wreck beyond the excellent signage. And you must admit to the layperson, it's hard to imagine what the rest of the vessel would look like. Thankfully, several reconstructions have taken, past, have taken place over the years, and you can see it here displayed in the museum. Um, it still doesn't look much like a ship unless you use your imagination. And here's one of the reconstructions. One is in a Cypriot museum. It's in a nice climate controlled environment. But this one you can see is certainly not wrapped in cotton wool. It is out on the open waves and takes people on sailing trips so that they can have an immersive experience of what sailing a merchant ship in 300 BC was like. And you can see that they even let me have a go at the helm. That is another one of my truly unforgettable experiences. And quite recently, the same vessel had another unforgettable experience when the replica of the wreck actually wrecked. If you want to hear the story of how a bunch of archeologists doing experimental archeology span on an archeological replica became shipwrecked, then follow this QR code to listen to a short podcast from one of the shipwrecked archeologists. So that's a bit of a clue that they, they were fine in the end. Better still, share it with anyone who is interested in, in maritime archaeology. It's quite an interesting short little podcast to listen to, and I highly recommend it. Now it's time to leave the safe zone of intrinsically interesting and in easily relatable shipwrecks to another aspect of maritime archaeology. Some of you may be looking at the screen thinking, this looks like another wreck. Well, it's not. Sometimes what we might call a shipwreck in layman's terms is actually a hulk. Keep that in mind for your next pub trivia night. A shipwreck usually implies an accident, often with loss of life, but we have some amazing maritime archaeology sites that were abandoned rather than lost in tragic circumstances. And the example that I'm showing you here is not underwater either, as you might assume maritime archaeology sites to be. Admittedly, it was buried in a riverbank, but it was excavated from waterlogged soil rather than underwater. This is called a medieval ship. So the timbers were placed in these large yellow pools. They were brought up individually rather than a hole as the Mary Rose was. The timbers were put in these large yellow pools to be desalinated and impregnated with polyethylene glycol, fancy wax. Then they were freeze dried and stored in this innovative and economical climate controlled storage as shown on the right. This process has taken over two decades, which is shorter than it took to conserve the Mary Rose. So that's something. In the meantime, many experts examine different aspects of the mar maritime archaeology remains. The middle image shows Nigel Nailing doing dendrochronology testing. Now, we don't know the name of this vessel, but due to the remarkable work of the archaeologists and specialists over the last 25 years, we know an awful lot about this vessel, such as that the timbers were cut down in 1449 and the vessel was constructed after the winter of 1457-58. That's really specific. And also it was constructed on the Iberian Peninsula in Spain. So yes, it is older than the Mary Rose, but it doesn't have the public recognition because it was raised in pieces during a rescue mission during building construction. But over 20 years of construction, of, of conservation has just finished and the team are working hard to find a location to set up a new museum and put this amazing puzzle together. So watch out, Mary Rose. You might have a rival in Newport, Wales very soon. I can't wait to see the finished reassembled ship. Now, a boat that has received considerable public recognition in recent years is one buried under a mound at Sutton Hoo. If you haven't seen it already, I highly recommend The Dig as a movie that does an excellent job of representing archaeology accurately and also balancing the hard, monotonous work along with the excitement of discovery. 
I just get so sick of watching movies that portray archaeology so incorrectly that it was a relief to, re to watch this movie. So make sure that you watch it and also recommend it to other people that might like a realistic glimpse into excavations. But back to the maritime archaeology. The vessel in question only exists as impressions in the soil, along with metal fastenings and grave goods. The timber has all disappeared. But the initial excavation at the outbreak of World War II and the more recent experimental archaeology reconstruction of the vessel has taught us so much about this little known period of shipbuilding. Not only that, these investigations have taught us about burial practices of the time. Great effort was made to transport this vessel away from the river to be placed under a mound in a purposeful act of remembrance. I look forward to seeing the reconstruction when it is done in hopefully a year or two's time. Another example of buried boats, but one that is distinctly in better condition, is this one. Sometimes boats are found in distinctly unmaritime locations, such as under a pyramid in a desert. That's pretty unmaritime to me. But this vessel would have been used on the River Nile, which is not far away. However, the act of taking this vessel out of the changeable riverine environment and putting it in a very dry environment has ensured that the excellent preservation of this Cheops solar barge, which is now on display in Giza. Pyramids and a buried ship. They are excellent talking points when trying to steer the conversation towards a more realistic understanding of maritime archaeology. Sadly, I've not been able to see this example of maritime heritage myself yet. So other publicly accessible examples of maritime archaeology are historic ships. They're the survivors from their period in history. On the left, we have the Victory, preserved in its dock at Portsmouth. And on the right is the HMS Caroline in Belfast. Of course, historic ships that tend to survive tend to be the famous ones, the warships, the vessels that achieve great things in their lifetime. So they're going to give a biased view of our shipbuilding past, but it is still a starting point for understanding the breadth of maritime archaeology and valuing the importance of preserving our maritime heritage. Then there are the replicas, and these are varying in accuracy and authenticity but they are a great public outreach tool to broaden our population's understanding and appreciation of our maritime heritage. On the left, we have the Matthew based out of Bristol. And on the right, I often feel sorry for the Golden Hind. It's squashed right between the tower blocks in London, but it certainly has prime location for lots of people to be able to see it. Now, I realize that we are still talking about ships and boats, but they are the more major form of technology that we study in maritime archeology. span here are two examples of hulks that the NASA has been working on for years. On the left are the remains of the Minesweeper, which is located halfway between the Jolly Roger pub and the Explosion Museum in Gosport. We use this site for our entry-level practical training and find the two venues extremely useful for providing classroom space, lunch, toilet facilities, and a connection to the general public, who of course want to start chatting with mud-covered people that they've just seen measuring and photographing that old wooden wreck and find out what on earth we've been doing. And that's when the conversation can start with a, well, you know, it's not actually a wreck, it's a hulk, and see where the conversation goes from there. Now, the image on the right is also from another site that we use for training. This is one of 10 wooden hulks and a plane that grace the five mile beach at Sandwich Flats in Kent. The stunning image is what usually welcomes me to work at Sandwich Flats, a site that I've been working on since 2018. I know from personal experience the planning and logistics that are required to work on these sites that may only be accessible for an hour or so at low tide. And by some quirk of the moon, the best time to work on these 10 wooden hulks is for about five days at super low tide, which occurs at dawn in February and sometimes in September. This stunning sunrise and the intrinsic, intrinsic fascination of these still unknown vessels trumps the early cold start. Surprisingly, I have never had problems with getting volunteers to help on field work or issues with low attendance at public beach walks, but it is a pretty beautiful site, as you can see. And here's a blatant promotion for anyone who would like to participate in our foreshore or underwater training or wants to come and see these amazing sites. Now, another type of vessel from our past is prehistoric boats. We don't have many examples of boats and watercraft from the prehistoric period. However, this does not mean that watercraft would have been unco uncommon. We do know that there were several different types of boat from this period, which included sewn plank boats, log boats, like you can see two examples of here, and small round skin boats known as coracles. Many of these were relatively small craft would have been used for coastal navigation, as well as for use inland on rivers, lakes, and locks. 
And often experimental archaeology is the way that we learn about these vessel types. And that is a very tangible way for members of the community to experience this aspect of maritime archaeology. During my time working as the Maritime Heritage Coordinator for Tasmania in Australia, there was an exciting experimental archaeology project to create a traditional bark, lo local bark canoe. Unsurprisingly, there are no bark canoes in the archaeological record. They're just too flimsy. But several images and many miniatures did exist in museum collections. The local Indigenous population immersed themselves in their long-standing culture and created the bark canoe that you can see on the right. And thankfully, it floated. As well as experimental archaeology, there is experiential archaeology. It's another great way to connect the public with their maritime heritage. And we did this last year with a Victorian boating weekend at which maritime lovers experienced the Kennet and Avon Canal while listening to readings from a recently published book about traditional boating, Victorian boating holidays. I had a marvellous time spending the weekend in a beautiful blue Victorian outfit, and it was so successful that we're doing it again this year. And everyone's going to be in costume this time, if they want to. And while this event was a very social occasion, it was also a learning experience. We learned what it was like to be on a canal boat and how to operate it. And the image on the right shows the group of us exploring the canal infrastructure and the aqueduct that we cruised over. Rivers are another inland waterway that can bring up a range of wonderful finds for maritime archaeologists, although often the majority of the work is done by mudlarkers. And I hope that there are a few clues to show you that this site is along the Thames. Chelsea, to be precise. I assisted with a friend's research into the development of bank, the embankment for public health benefits in Victorian times and had a lovely time mudlarking and archaeologically recording both loose finds and more permanent remains of structures. And of course, lots of people would call down from the pathway asking if we were looking for gold or some other suitably witty comment. And they're often greeted with a quick retort about how what we were doing was much more fascinating than that. And I'm pleased to say that some were converted to our cause. There are much more permanent structures that contribute to the maritime environment and help us tell stories of our past. Along the coastline, there will be maritime infrastructure showing a variety of defence mechanisms. On the left is an example of a Martello Tower, which defended us from invading forces. And there are numerous examples of these military structures spanning hundreds of years and showing different designs. On the right, we see a lighthouse, which is an example of our defence mechanisms against the often harsh environment of the sea. Hopefully this example of keeping us safe at sea will be particularly relevant this year. And that's because when lighthouses fail to keep us safe at sea, a rescue mission is required. And there is evidence of these life-saving missions in the maritime archaeological record. While it was haphazard or locally based for hundreds of years, the establishment of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution was a great advancement in safety at sea and has added lifeboats and lifeboat stations to the maritime archaeology record. And this example of keeping us safe at sea is relevant because it's the 200th year of the RNLI. So keep an eye out for exhibitions and events that celebrate this wonderful institution that still continues its good work to this day. When no rescue mission is possible, that's when we can find survivor camps in the maritime archaeology record. In my student days, I was lucky enough to work on one of these survivor camps at a place called Dirk Hartog Island. Seeing as only two people live on the island and very few people visit, I thought you might appreciate a map of where it is off the coast of, South, of Western Australia. It's the red dot. It's very remote, which is why you can see that no rescue mission was forthcoming. And the survivors camp is from the French whaler Perseverant, which was believed to have been driven ashore there in 1841. The crew, the crew abandoned ship and set up camp on the island. And you can see there's some excavations going on there. And five men died of scurvy before the survivors set sail for Java, Indonesia in four of the ship's small boats. This is a common story around the coastline of Australia and other places around the world. And this leads us to another site type in maritime archaeology. It was a whaling vessel that was wrecked on the Western Australian coast. And of course, there were whaling stations to support these whaling vessels. They were once a vital part of our world economy, and they are very much a foreign concept to those in the Western world who are now more interested in whale watching. But you can see from the cover of this nomination report for World Heritage Recognition that the Red Bay Whaling Station in Canada is an important part of our maritime, my, maritime heritage that should be protected, remembered and learned from. And these are all good talking points in this day and age of increased concern about protecting our wild, wildlife. We might not agree what happened in, the, in our heritage, but it's important to remember it and learn from it. 
Other land-based structures that can help us tell the maritime heritage story are ports and harbours. While many still function in industry, the majority of the population are likely to experience these as departure points for holidays, travel and tourism. These sites can range from small extensions to natural harbours to large purpose-built harbours that have been created to berth large ships, and I've got examples of a variety of different harbours here. The different buildings within a harbour or port may also provide information on goods being exported and imported, the trade links associated with the site. They really are a hub as part of a large network. Shipbuilding sites may also be found in close association with these site types. And a port or harbour can often represent a long period of occupation or underwater. There may be other isolated finds from different periods would have been lost or discarded. So you can see that these are a vital part of our maritime archaeological heritage. Jetty and piers are in the liminal zone that connect the land and the water and are therefore more likely to be in a layperson's experience. The pictures that I have here are from the jetty at Port Arlington, Victoria in Australia. Jetties and piers can tell us about a variety of different aspects of our culture. They can be purely functional as part of maritime industry, allowing vessels to load and unload safely in waters not naturally inclined to that purpose. The first underwater site that I ever worked on was a jetty in South Australia. That part of the Great South Land is known for its jetties and piers because it has a very shallow foreshore area, no decent roads, and several extremely important coastal industries that need to get their products to other locations. Therefore, it was crucial to have piers and jetties all along the coast to serve this purpose. They now demonstrate the other aspect of maritime archaeology that's revealed by jetties and piers, recreation. These foreshore structures are no longer needed for industry and have either fallen into disrepair, as you can see here, or are used by recreational vessels, fishermen, promenaders, jetty jumpers, or by maritime archaeologists needing a safe environment to learn their skills, which is what I did. Of course, there is another avenue of research and general talking point that can come from these maritime archaeological remains, coastal erosion and climate change. By understanding how jetties and piers relate to their original coastline and now the current coastline, we have tangible cultural evidence of how our natural environment is changing. And that's a very hot topic of conversation right now. Some of these types of industry that were served by the jetties were distinctly land-based, such as mining or farm produce, but some of the industry was indelibly linked to their maritime environment. This impressive earthworks are the remains of the Elizabethan salt pans near Hadrian Cycleway. For nearly 700 years, salt was made from seawater along the Cumbrian coast, and this site is a remarkably well-preserved example of this tradition. For those of us who take for granted the ability to reach for the salt shaker at home or any eating establishment, the historical efforts to create salt when explained and the physical show, sh sites being shown are a brilliant way to bring the diversity of maritime archaeology alive to the general public. Yes, this is a series of wooden stakes on a beach. Some may say that it's not very interesting and would dismiss these and not understand their use in the past or their significance today. And that's a great shame because not only are these stakes important evidence of our maritime industries, they are also evidence of past tide change and can show evidence of changing sea levels and climate change. These wooden stakes are part of the work that we've been doing at Sandwich. And on the left, you can see the, um, the images of the wooden stakes. And on the right, you can see the yellow dots that indicate the fish trap stakes, which makes much more sense when you can get an overall impression of them as a whole which is why we turn them into this geolocated app. Just scan the code and you can have a copy for yourself. So numerous people that use Sandwich Bay can have a better understanding of them. We created this app and it is regularly used on the beach walks and it's a really amazing resource that we've used, that we've created. The red dots are the wooden wrecks that I mentioned before and the plane. And feel free to use this and drive to Kent and have a wonderful beach walk. Remember, low tide in winter, is at dawn and that's the best time to go and see it. And don't forget to check out the fish traps because they truly are amazing, the remains that are still there. Now, another aspect of maritime archaeology that is a little harder to interpret for the layperson is submerged landscapes. Going deep back in time, some of the earliest maritime archaeological evidence can be found on submerged landscapes. Where the coastline has changed over the centuries, we can discover evidence of human habitation or settlements which were once on dry land but have now been preserved in the underwater environment. Dogger Bank in the middle of the North Sea is an excellent example of this. This sandbank is the remains of Doggerland, which used to connect the British Isles to mainland Europe. 
These sites may tell us more about how people lived, particularly during the prehistoric period, and it's they're more likely to tell us about uh, how people lived and their terrestrial equivalents. This is due to the better survival rates for organic materials in a wet environment, and they can also provide information on migration patterns and how people coped with rising sea levels and climate change in the past, and maybe they might give us tips for the future. The site of Boulder Cliff is another excellent example our colleagues at the Maritime Archaeology Trust have been working on, and they've been working on this site for decades and continue to make regular new discoveries. Located in the Solent, UK, so far it's produced artefacts rarely found in the British Mesolithic sites on land, including string, flint tools, crafted peg-like roundwood, charcoal, wood chippings, and a reused pit containing burnt flints, all which point to a site of industrial activity. So this is really quite an important site, and you can see why they keep going back and back. It just so happens that submerged landscapes were in the news not once, but twice this week. The title of the story on the left is pretty descriptive, particularly when you look at the circular sector scan sonar images that do indeed show Stonehenge-like remains on the lake bed in Michigan. And the story on the right reveals perhaps the oldest submerged man-made structure, which is an almost kilometre long stone wall, possibly used for rounding up deer for hunting 10,000 years ago. So there's always new discoveries being made. So keep an eye out on the news. And just to prove that I get around a bit and support all aspects of maritime archaeology, here's a photo of me assisting with recording a cave with shell middens that is now submerged in the Parramatta River in Sydney, Australia. Coming in a bit closer to our own time are submerged settlements. There is a very famous submerged settlement known in popular culture, and that is known as Atlantis. And there's a whole range of theories as to whether it was a metaphor or mythological or really existed. Some are even convinced that it was lo located off the coast of Cyprus or Spain or a raft of other locations. But there are real life submerged settlements that are just as fascinating. Pavlo Petri in Greece is the world's oldest submerged town at 5,000 years old. There are streets and buildings of foundations covering 50,000 square miles in crystal clear waters only three metres deep, which makes it easily visible without the need for diving equipment and any experience. So after almost 2,000 years of continuous settlement, an earthquake condemned this settlement to the sea, but preserved it for us to experience all these years later. Close to home, both geographically and in time, we have the remains of the medieval town of Dunwich that are now submerged off the Suffolk coast. Unsurprisingly, the water is not crystal clear in that part of the world. In fact, the underwater visibility is so bad that innovative acoustic imaging camera equipment was used on this site so that divers could see through the murk to examine the submerged remains. These are the purple cones in the image that you can see. That's what the diver actually sees underwater. You can scan the code to find out more about these fascinating investigations. It'll take you to the report. Dunwich was a significant medieval town and port, but a series of storm events in 1286-87 began its descent into the sea. This image, um, and so you can see how it's uh, de degraded over the centuries and continues to do so today. And this is coastal erosion that we're becoming much more aware of. But sometimes the transition goes the other way and we find maritime settlements inland. In the 11th century, Sandwich and Kent was one of the five great sink ports, which makes sense when you look at the map on the left. Between the 11th and 13th centuries, it was the biggest port in England, but now it is two miles inland and a very lovely, quaint, historic town. It's hard to believe that it once was the biggest port in England. It's only now connected to the sea by a length of the River Stour, as is shown by the modern map on the right. So things can definitely change in the coastal environment. A very particular type of maritime settlement is a cranog. Cranogs are a type of settlement known to date from the Neolithic period, 6000 BC, with some examples showing use right up to the 17th century. The image on the left shows the archaeological remains of a cranog being investigated by a diver, while the image on the right shows a reproduction of what we think the entire structure would have looked like. My predecessors at the NAS were involved in creating this replica, and we were very upset when it was destroyed by fire a few years ago. Thankfully, the Scottish Cranog Centre has almost finished rebuilding and should be ready to open later this year. Cranogs have been discovered in the locks and lakes of Scotland, in Ireland and also in Wales. The side of the Cranogs varies, but they have been found up to 30 metres in diameter. 
Unlike shipwrecks, we may, which may exhibit the time capsule effect, Cranogs often saw long periods of occupation and the finds on Cranog sites will represent this. There are two principal types of Cranogs that have been recorded, those that are built up of stone to create an artificial island and those built up on sticks like you see here. The reason for building these settlements out of the water is unknown, but some suggested ideas are a better defensive position, closeness to resources, and also making the best use of the land by having all the fertile land available for farming rather than for people living on it. The remains of similar style dwellings have also been found in the lakes in Switzerland. A perhaps unexpected type of maritime archaeology site is graffiti sites. Now, graffiti sites these days tends to be sending the message, I was here. Thankfully, in the past, people felt the urge to record that this ship was here, which is incredibly useful for us down the generations. Now, of course, graffiti artists can be of all levels of skills, so the depictions must be taken with a bit of grain of salt, but they are still an important record of ship type and technology in a particular geographical area. And also it, was in, it records what the locals or even visiting sailors thought was important to record. And once again, this could be an interesting topic of conversation in a social situation that starts off with, have you considered the value of historical ship graffiti? And ends with, let me tell you about maritime archeology. span and if you need a resource to back you up, there are a growing number of databases on the subject. This QR code will take you to one on, ship, on Cypriot graffiti, and we helped develop it last year. And it's quite an interesting site to investigate and look at all the different types of graffiti that have been recorded there. We're going to finish with my favorite aspect of maritime archeology, span anchors. We found that anchors are immediately relatable when talking to the public about maritime archaeology, from actual anchors along the seaside promenades to anchors on clothing, brand names, to jewellery, tea towels, and even tattoos. There are anchors everywhere, which is why we developed the Big Anchor Project to crowdsource recording anchors around the world, underwater, outside pubs, and in the middle of roundabouts. Wherever there are anchors, they can be recorded on this database. We've also got a Facebook page for the project where people can share their love of anchors on a more superficial level through images of anchors on tea towels, coffee mugs and PJs. More recently, we established World Anchor Day. And here's an example of some of the social media that we created for the inaugural World Anchor Day. It's World Anchor Day. We like anchors of all sorts. This one happens to be a stockless anchor and there's others that are stocked anchors. But either of them can go on our app. We like all of them to be recorded so that we can all share the information and learn from them. Happy World Anchor Day. So why not join in the fun this year and celebrate with us on the 27th of July? So my love of anchors goes way back. In 2006, I volunteered on a project to record an ancient anchorage in Cyprus. Here is me in the lovely warm waters of the south coast of Cyprus with my trusty tape measure. I'm surrounded by just a few examples of the 160 stone anchors that we found. That is a definite anchorage site there. And this is what the anchorage site looks like in modern times above the water. There is a nearby sacred site, which may have been the reason for the number of stone anchors found in the area. They are the accidental losses from the many pilgrims that came to the area in the Bronze Age. And here is a quick summary of what we recorded from above. There's a high chance that there are more anchors underneath the current foreshore. Anchorages can contain vast amounts of information about ship technology, anchor technology, weather patterns, and changing sea levels. They are an amazing aspect of maritime archaeology, and surprisingly, they are an easy topic to talk about with the general public. So thank you for joining me on a whirlwind trip around the many and varied sites that make up maritime archaeology. I hope that you have enjoyed and appreciated the diversity and can take away some tips for sharing this knowledge with the wider world. In this current climate, our maritime heritage is threatened by climate change, developments and human activity, and it is all our responsibility to do all we can to preserve, protect and promote this important aspect that affects all our lives. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions and please feel free to contact me in the future. Thank you so much, Peter. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm going to confess, when I was, I was reading your, your abstract and I was preparing for tonight and I was thinking about maritime archaeology and I was thinking, I don't really know anything about maritime archaeology. <laughs> and you went through that and I thought, oh, 
oh I can twist that like that oh I don't know about those <laughs> exactly <laughs> I've been taking off my list and uh yeah it's 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 just you know kind of you're absolutely right that it's so easy for us to think about it as shipwrecks or you know kind of it's things that are underwater and and actually mm-hmm. it's so much more than that and I think it is bringing it all together is what makes it really exciting isn't it it's that transition it's that you know incredible liminal landscape that we have as we move from 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 land to sea so yeah that was um very inspiring um in terms of my own archaeological journey and thinking about what's next and I'm absolutely going out looking for some anchors to record as well oh fantastic (laughs) excellent thank you very much that's really great. And hopefully you can tick off some other different types of sites off your list. Definitely, definitely. It's, it's uh, yeah, I feel like I've got to kind of get the whole set now. So we've got a few questions coming in. Um, I'm going to be really cheeky and I'm going to ask my own first. Um, and um, you talked a little bit, you mentioned a couple of occasions, kind of um, climate change and the fact that that is something that is affecting all of us now. Um, I I just wondered kind of how big an impact you're seeing on your work um, in terms of climate change. I know obviously you work in many different environments, um, but is it, you know, for example, in, in an underwater context, is it affecting kind of preservation levels or are you seeing a difference um, in how you record the archaeology? Yeah, so um, the, the best way to kind of have a, a tangible um, experience is so I've been working on Sandwich, this lovely site, since 2018, and that's six years, and I have been seeing some really drastic changes in the 10 wrecks that they're, they're just being eaten away by shipworm because they're being more exposed and because, you know, the, the sediment levels are changing the beach that we work on is entirely different. Thankfully, it's actually a lot easier to work on now. We used to have to have a, a, a big shingle bank to climb at the end of a long day on the beach, and now it's flat. So that's kind of a benefit, but surely that's not good. It's not how it should be, but it makes it easy for me to get home. Um, yeah, so that's kind of on a, a foreshore site. Underwater, There's, I think it's just that there's a lot more awareness now, and we are seeing differences underwater. So Historic England for quite some time now has been getting us to kind of do different sampling and they wanted us to test um, pH levels for metal wrecks in particular. So we're kind of, we, I think in the past, it's been more like, oh, cultural heritage, yep, history, all that kind of stuff. And now it's a lot more, we are part of a broader science. We're part, we have to understand how climate change works, but we are seeing tangible evidence underwater, particularly with ships, shipwrecks disintegrating um you know seeing how storm weather events can have a more drastic um, effect on our heritage and that's why i think it's really important that we're not we we, we i think i have to admit we, we're not going to be able to preserve everything it used to be you raise the mary rose you put it in a museum fantastic it's there forever it's not it costs a lot of money to still keep it going we can't raise shipwrecks anymore it's just it's too expensive and would take a, a lot of investment. It would be amazing if we did it. And in fact, we want to do it with the London shipwreck, but um, it, it's not really feasible without great investment. But we're not, we also can't preserve the UNESCO Convention on the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage tells us we must preserve in situ. No one gave that memo to the environment. Um, so we have to preserve by record. So that's why everyone can preserve stuff. We can take photos. That's a preservation. So just by taking a photo of a bit of archaeology, wet, dry, slightly soggy, you are helping preserve maritime archaeology. And that's a really important thing because it's probably not going to be there for very much longer, which is very sad, but at least we have a record of it and can learn from that. So the important question there is if people are taking their photos, what should they, where should they send them? What should they do with them? Well, there's all sorts of answers to that. If you happen to be on this lovely beach, we have an app that you can report it on. Um, Citizen, the coastal and intertidal archaeological zone network, I didn't get that quite right. Anyway, Citizen doesn't quite exist anymore, but it has an app. So you can record on that Citizen app. So it's Citizen, but with an A instead of an E. Google it. It's on, yep, online on all of your play stores so it's still supported by the museum of london but um yeah so you can still report things on it so that's great um if you're writing reports and things like that there's all sorts of you know standard ways that you can but wherever you um do your uh 
reports where you get them backed up. So there's the archaeological data service, there's Oasis, um, that's for more kind of, oh, thank you, someone's just put the link in there, well done, um, for the Citizen app. Yeah, so it's it's important just to record stuff. Um, I mean, the Facebook pages are great, at least you're sharing it as an absolute bare minimum, sharing with other people, but there are various kind of databases that things can be shared on. Um, unfortunately, not uh, universal. But we have the Big Anchor Project, which is a database. We also have Big Canon Project, which is another crowdsourced database. Who knows what the future will hold for, for that sort of thing. I think that's it. It's really exciting, isn't it, that there are more and more ways in which people can um, kind of participate and, and actively engage in, in ensuring that, that these sites are recorded and protected um, just by simply taking a photograph when you're out for a walk. Um, exactly. It's fantastic. So let's get through some of these questions. I'll, I'll stop talking. Um, so we've got a couple of quick fire ones here, I think, um, about your the early part of your talk when you were discussing kind of replicas and racks and hulks. So is the Cutty Sark now classed as a replica or is it a modern version of the ship of Theseus? <laughs> oh, that's not a quick answer. I mean, technically, <laughs> it, it's it's a grandpa's act. It's the same thing as the victory. I mean, technically, the Cutty Sark is still the Cutty Sark. Well, it's the Cutty Sark. It had various names before. But I, I'm not entirely sure of the percentage of how much has been repaired. Obviously, it had a big fire a couple of, well, quite a few years ago now. Um, that's definitely a debate for a pub or an entire conference. I'm sorry I can't provide a clear answer on that, but it's definitely an interesting discussion. So well done to whoever asked that question. Um, and we've got another one. It's This is a, a Rockle Hulk question. Uh, would the Amsterdam at Ulvaheim be regarded as a wreck or a Hulk? Another another curly question. I mean, a hulks, hulks tend to be, you know, sitting upright and disintegrating um, kind of so that you can kind of see their cross sec, their bird's eye view. Um, that's usually a pretty good way. But um, I, I think that the from I'm, I'm not an expert on this, um, but I think that it did actually have an accident. So I think I don't think it was abandoned because it's got lots of stuff still on board, which is why people want to excavate it. So I would say that it's probably technically a shipwreck. And can I just promote the fact that there are excellent beach walks that the locals give? So you can go and ask them because they're the experts. Brilliant. I'm the Good. conduit. I'll tell you where to get the answer to. <laughs> perfect, perfect. So um, on to the next one. And this is... Um, Kind of moving kind of further into the talk and the different types of landscapes that um would be would covered by maritime archaeology do you include ancient walkways across march across march i can't say the word marshes <laughs> in your studies i.e bronze age structures uh langley at uh, eastbourne or flag fan um the answer is yes, they would definitely be classified as maritime part of maritime landscapes. Um, I personally have never studied any of those because that is an entirely another area of expertise. They are very specialised. Um, and so, yeah, you have to be a real boffin in that area to, to be able to work in that in that department. But, yeah, uh, submerged, I would, I would kind of classify that under submerged landscapes. So, yeah, absolutely fascinating, but I don't know much about them. I think that's it. It's 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 amazing, isn't it? The diversity you have mm, across yeah. maritime archaeology. I, would, I, would, and... I have I have various areas of expertise, and then lots of kind of general knowledge, and I, I like it that way. I, but I usually know who to answer, who to ask if I don't know the answer. That's the thing, isn't it? It's just keep asking questions. Always ask the questions. Yeah. Um. Um. To the next. Question. Um. Yes, uh, I recommend our textbook, which you can <laughs> shop. So this is going to be blank promotion. Um, we also have an entry level online training course that you can do. So it's on our website and you can do it for water people or for soggy foreshore people. Uh, and then we do practical training. But it's free. Definitely places to start. But I mean, 
our job to share this ship. So another blatant plug to Brewers. We're very nice. Very <laughs> yes. And, and um, you know, there's so many ways to get involved, aren't there, as well? Volunteering, um, as well as the kind of e-learning. Um, sorry about that, folks. Um, so, next one. Um, does maritime archaeology extend to working out ancient trade routes? It does. And in, actually, that was my honours thesis. Um, so, yes, I, um, yeah, I... I determined some trade routes in the Mediterranean through anchor pass patterns of anchors. I like anchors. Um, yeah, so, yes, it's all about, I mean, that would kind of also border into maritime history. But, yeah, ancient trade routes. You can do that through um, kind of pottery remains, see how things are transported. There's all sorts of different ways that uh, trade routes can be determined. So, yeah, that's definitely in our bag. I think that, I, I mean, that for me is, is, I think that's really exciting, that idea of kind of connecting people and how we moved around, um, you know, this the sea was just, that was our, our road network, wasn't it, in the past? Mm -hmm. And um, the way in which actually it gave us in some ways more freedoms and, and more ease of access to different countries, different people, um, yeah. different materials, I think, yeah, is, is, is so exciting to think about and to learn about. And if I could just give a quick example, one of the projects that we've been working on most recently, we actually used the trade routes to determine what the wreck was because, you know, unfortunately, most wrecks don't have their name on them when you find them, but they do have artefacts. And so you look at the artefacts and you go, well, where's this from? Where's that from? And by determining the, the international cargo, we found out that we actually were able to find the name of the ship and that's the client Hollandia. And uh, yeah. My boss is in charge of that excavation, uh, not sorry, not excavation, investigation. And it's an amazing story about the ship that started a Dutch Anglo war. That sounds brilliant. That sounds like a story to dive into. Definitely. Um, so we've got time for a couple more. Um, and we've got one from somebody who grew up near Sandwich Bay. Um, they spent many hours there and are asking if you know if the World War II aircraft wreck has been excavated now. No, so um, the Sandwich Bay is got so many different layers of protection because it's got birds there that need to be protected, um, and it's a so it's a wildlife site and it's got unexploded ordnance there. So you don't really want to go digging there unless you know what you're doing. Unfortunately, the B seventeen there it's it's actually quite visible. It's a nice um a kind of navigation point. To, to find where you are on, on the on the beach. Um, it is being excavated by the environment. So it used to be so that you could actually walk across the wings. Not that I recommend that, that would be very detrimental to it, but not so long ago, it used to be very much more intact and now it's looking a bit sad. And there is a, a local person who is um, kind of gathering the bits that fall off and then restoring them and giving them to the lo local aircraft museum. So gradually, more and more of the aircraft is ending up in the museum. So eventually it'll all probably be there, but in bits. Um, but if anyone's interested, we do run monthly low tide walks and we can go and show you the walk there. So that person might like to join us in March for our low tide walk. Brilliant. And um, we did have a few people ask in the chat about the QR codes and the links. Um, so we've let them know that we will follow up um after tonight with an, an email that has all of the links for them so so people can go away and uh, dive a bit deeper into some of the resources and the the websites that you you mentioned and obviously yeah go and check out the the maritime um archaeological society's website and find out about the e-learning the walks the volunteering um yeah brilliant so um let's see what's next Okay. Um, oh, this is an interesting one. Um, what is your view about the removal of features such as sea henge on the North Norfolk foreshore because it was threatened with erosion? So do you think, obviously you've talked about this a little bit before, um, but kind of this is the, I guess, the the opposite um, to, to that kind of leave it in situ. And this was a case where it was removed. Now, I, I must admit, I actually don't know about this case in particular, but I see nothing wrong with the appropriate removal of heritage if it means that it's going to be protected. I mean, the Mary Rose was removed 
admittedly that was because you know there was the public interest in doing that it wasn't necessarily being saved at the time it wouldn't be doing in, you know in very good condition now if it was still there but you know there is a time and a place for doing such thing i don't know the circumstances of Seahenge being removed whether it was done you know pro appropriately by you know professional archaeologists whether it was conserved i mean very very rarely do we actually raise anything from the seabed because it just costs so much to conserve. And that was my point with the Mary Rose and also with the Vasa. I mean, even a, a tiny little object, um, the kind of the story that's going around at the moment is there is a friend who has raised a tiny little um, navigational instrument and it's gonna cost them two and a half thousand pounds to conserve. And I think that they are wishing that they left it on the seabed because it's their responsibility to pay that money to get it preserved. Yeah. So, um, if it's if something is raised, conserved, preserved, and then shared for everyone to see, then it's better than it not existing in the past. Uh, sorry, into the future. So yeah, I, I hope that that kind of gave a bit of perspective, but I I don't know the specific examples. Sorry about that. That's quite all right. I was um I was actually I was really pleased you mentioned the Cranach Centre. Um, which is not too far from where I live. And I was actually up there um, at the end of last year and um, was having a conversation with the staff there about the challenges that they have about the long-term preservation of some of the timbers from the original, you know, from, mm. from the original planet um, and how they uh, are trying to manage that process, particularly as they are moving from, from one side of Loch Tay to the other to create a new museum and visitor centre. So, mm. um, yeah, I think... It's an incredibly challenging um, situation, isn't it, to kind of think yeah. about the, the long term costs and and the mediums that you use to kind of ensure that preservation. Yeah, and Definitely. thankfully, there's there's all sorts of developments in conservation techniques happening all the time, which we really need. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a constant. Just because you know the Mary Rose, the Vasa are in their museums, that doesn't mean that you know there's not new requirements for them being conserved in new and different ways always going to be uh, an ongoing job absolutely um so we've had a um another question which is about um offshore survey companies um and they're asking if if they have a requirement to um report archaeological or um kind of nautical sites if they if they discover them as they're working how how does that work they do and actually in my previous job i used to work for wessex archaeology i was uh, responsible for training those people in how to report the finds that they made. So dredging companies, wind farms, all those kind of offshore companies that um, do the, the work, they have a requirement to report any finds that they have. And there's a nice kind of easy system. And I, I used to go around and take a little box of artifacts to show them and get them all enthused. And they quite liked that. They didn't like the forms so much, but they could see the benefit of it. And sometimes if it's a really important area where they where it's going to, where you know there's going to be lots of archaeological evidence, so like Dogger Bank, you would actually have an archaeologist on board that vessel, sometimes even two, because those vessels tend to work around the clock. Um, I've had colleagues and friends who have gone working in the North Sea and they've just been on call for like three weeks and they just go looking at, um, you know, what, what, what's being brought up in the, the dredging or the looking at the ROV footage or whatever. So, yes, there is actually legal requirements that um, companies do that sort of thing. Um, but if there's not an archaeologist on board, who knows what's going on? But I think that they're, they're usually the companies are usually pretty good at that. And that's how we found some pretty amazing artifacts and made some pretty fantastic discoveries. So we wouldn't be able to do it without those companies. So yeah. and I guess I, I guess in a way, do the you kind of the, the the work they're doing ultimately kind of in, in some instances benefit um your work as well in the you know kind of thinking of um like the development of new technology and things that enable you to potentially um either explore the seabed in a, in a in a more detailed way or think about how you record some of that material yeah yeah there's always new things being developed um so yeah it's it's quite good that we all we can try and work together where wherever possible and sometimes there's really big projects like when Portsmouth Harbour was dredged to make way for the new aircraft carrier there was an absolutely massive project it went for years and years and years where you know, thousands and thousands of objects were brought up during the dredging. And so archaeologists had to be there on site to process. And we found everything from huge anchors to quite a few bombs that did mean that there was evacuations of the local population while that was dealt with, to tiny little human remains that were really quite poignant. 
Um, so yeah, it's an amazing, like that archaeology wouldn't have been found unless there was that development happening and the companies to pay for that. Brilliant. So we're, we're just over eight o'clock. So it's it's time to draw things to a close. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you one last question, but I just want to say I'm really sorry to anybody whose question we haven't had time to get to this evening. Thank you so much for all your all your questions and enthusiasm for for Peter's talk. I know there's been some some lovely feedback in the the chat for you, Peter. There, um, but I just wanted to kind of ask, um, thinking about your role and, and the work you do around kind of enabling people to to engage with with maritime archaeology. What's your what's your one top tip if somebody thinks, oh, do you know that could that could maybe be a career for me, or that's something I really want to get more involved in and learn more about. What's the one thing you would suggest that they do? I'd say get a nice broad understanding of maritime archaeology. Once again, we can help with that. But I think it's really good to have a speciality. So what's what's going to be your thing? What's going to be your, um, it sounds a bit crass, but what's your selling point? So I think, is it going to be a particular time period that you specialise in, a particular artefact type, a particular technique? And that's something that's going to get you amazing places. So, yeah. I specialised in anchors when I was uh, studying and I got invited to go to Cyprus for the first time because I specialised in anchors and I've never looked back. So, yeah, once once you have that specialty, you never know where it can take you. Excellent. Yeah. So just to finish off, um, I want to thank you once again, Peter. That was that was brilliant. And I feel like I could ask you questions all night. Um, I think it's it's such an exciting subject and there's there's, there's so much amazing um, archaeology uh, to discover kind of um, underwater and in that um, foreshore area. Um, but just to wrap up, I want to let you know um, about the next This Is Archaeology lecture, um, which is rooted in history, branching into the future, the story of the nation's forests. And that's with Lawrence Shaw, who's the lead historic environment advisor at Forestry England. Uh, so that's taking place on the 21st of March. And I think there should be a link in the chat for you there. And we've also got another online event in March, which is an evening with National Trust archaeologists. So that's on the 7th of March. And uh, we'll be hearing from several of the archaeologists about the latest discoveries across National Trust properties. Um, we've done some good plugs for the Maritime Archaeological Society tonight. Um, I do want to do one for the CBA as well. Um, obviously, we are a, a small charity. We rely on your support to be able to do events like this. So if you'd like to consider making a donation to help us, we would really appreciate it. And again, I think there should be a link in the chat for you there. Um, and finally, I think I forgot to mention our feedback survey. Um, again, another link for you. Um, if you could drop us a line, Fill that in and uh, let us know what you thought of this evening's lecture, but also let us know about your ideas and thoughts for future lectures and who you'd like to see speaking in the in the series. Um, so that's it. I've done all of my spiel. It just remains for me to say thank you once again, Peter. Um, absolutely brilliant talk. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, everybody who's joined us this evening. We do hope we will see you at the next lecture. Um, I'll close the close the webinar now. Um, it is quite an abrupt finish, so it will um, end the, the webinar for everybody when I hit the button. Um, so once again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your evenings. Good night. Thank you.